Hello, I'm Rob Hirschfeld. The December 3rd Cloud 2030 session was about planning for our larger four-hour January 7th session, which I hope you'll join us for. Um, and it was actually a really good conversation because we tried to summarize things that were going on and discuss how we were going to discuss larger issues as a group. Uh, really important, we, we decided to talk about inflection points uh, and places where we see changes that are sort of building up and if that's going to become part of the way we, we categorize all the different sections, the six sections of um, future talk that we want to have at the big summit. I think you'll find this really interesting and worthwhile as a conversation as you go to think about how to frame the future. This conversation will um, be instructive. Enjoy. The 2030.cloud. Thanks. What, what I see us, our conversations revolving around is a whole bunch of, um, I see them very clearly as, as levers with a fulcrum in the middle. And so the lever is a topic. There's a fulcrum where the balance point is and there's pressures on either side of that. And so to me, the, the, the uh, half day session is about you know, four, potentially two tracks with eight um, conversations about identifying these fulcrums. There's Rich, he'll help hail opinions. Um, the, so, so as we identify these fulcrums, those become the discussion topics. And then in each, in each group, they would identify, we, I think as a group, we can identify what those fulcrums are, what the topics are, but then that the groups, the subgroups would say, all right, this is the what the fulcrum is. This is where we think it's positioned on that. These are the, the pressures bearing down on those fulcrums. Um, and then make make some discussions about what the, if things back in balance or if they go further out of balance. So it, so to me, the conversation comes back to um, that, you know, basically a, a set of, of balancing balanced equations. Didn't mean it quite that mathematically, but um, where we could we could actually say, hey, in, in these in these years, we see these things being out of balance today, these things, these forces writing the balance or tipping it further. Um, it's super vague. You want me to be specific? Would that that would be helpful, maybe. So we've talked in the past about the amount of capital flowing into um, some of the IT markets. Uh, Amazon's a great, a, a perfect example of, of just how much money and resources they are able to pour into um, being a cloud platform and, and dominating the market from that perspective. Um, and we keep seeing big companies acquiring smaller, uh, Salesforce and Slack, great example um, of these, these huge consolidative pressures where, where there's huge amounts of capital at play. Um, from very big players. So that to me, consult, you know, uh, monopolies versus um, small you know, ecosystems are, are the, would be, would be a two factors on a, on a balanced scale. And then you could have, does that make sense as a topic area? Rich, we're talking about, um, and Tyler, we're talking about um, planning for the January 7th uh, half day. Okay, session. and are you talking about a specific session right now? I'm trying to figure out how to theme out the sessions so that we can, we, when we break into sessions, I think we're, we, we should have probably six sessions and one joining session at the end, like a, a readout report would mm -hmm. be the way I'd structure it. And then, but each, I wanted some structure going into those, those sessions so that when we do the readout, they're all in, a, in the same language. And the, the, the structure that you're looking for is kind of a, is it a, like a debate structure or, you know, a pro or con type of thing? What is that? Are you, are you trying to get a, you know, here's the question posed. Here are the readily identified, fairly strong positions that differ from one another and then you report on it. Is that the idea that you're, you're dealing with here? I think so. I'm, I'm, I'm using a very physical metaphor of a balance beam with the opposite, with the opposition, the, 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 the opposite forces um, right. pulling on it. But I think what you're describing is 
you know, you could have two versions of the future. Well, are you are you familiar with Porter's theorem? Because that's what you're describing, kind of. Oh, no. All right, so let me let me post the link. All right, so these are the forces that drive economic components between suppliers, suppliers, and consumers, and and barriers to entries and other components that drive economic rivalry. Okay. It's like one of the exercises we did is we did this from several views from like what would a customer look like, what would a cloud provider look like, you know, so you could actually do different threads inside of the model, but there's a pretty well established model for doing these types of comparatives. Yeah, these are, these are porters, um, forces. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's five forces. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So were you I suggesting that this would be the structure used to discuss any one of these topic areas? Was that the, the, the notion? Well, I was just listening to what Rob was talking about yeah. with the, the teeter tot and really mm -hmm. kind of what Porter's five forces you know, tries to depict. Yeah, and this you is much like... easier than using uh, wordly mapping. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you don't want to do that in a, in a group <laughs> like this. Um, um no i i think if if you kind of opened up a this is a good structure i mean it's basically you know if we're thinking about 2030 and there's a particular topic area you can talk about the present situation you know suppliers buyers comp competitive situation what are really the 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 substitutions you know what what gets what else is coming in, and and what are the threats? You know, it's, it's a good it's a good you know way to go through it and organize it at the end if you wanted to, and you'll find that probably there there are any number of people who will participate and kind of say you know have a particular position as to the the right way to go. I really like this. Because this way we can tell people exactly how we're going to have structured the discussion. They can read about it in in advance, right? I, I love not inventing something, especially <laughs> when somebody much smarter than me has thought it through already. So, yeah. So if we if we're saying we're going to do, um, we have a four hour session. I I think that's pretty straightforward. I think two breakouts, two tracks. Um, so, so that we can have six conversations we'll have some in entry and then we're going to have um wrap up so this thing we need at least an hour for that um plus some biological time in the middle uh that leaves us to sort of come up with six topics and seed them from that and then we have to find six moderators for the topics i don't think that's crazy it'd be crazy hard because i know plenty of passionate people about these topics so that reasonable from a framing uh, i i think that we should revisit if the porters uh five forces is the best um hmm, okay. framework based off of the topics that are picked yeah but i'm okay with that using that right now and i'm just i'm thinking about the topics so i'm thinking yeah. ahead um, got it no i, I you're i i I, I I'm glad you're being specific. I'm I'm very used to being fluid and re, and uh, so yes, we should definitely measure, you know, pick the topics, go through a loop, make sure it makes sense, and then um, get closer. And then we need to find the moderators so that they can seed the questions and and start preparing. Do you so, have a a particular sense about the the conference? Is if we're talking 2030. Is this mm -hmm. about forecast? Uh, I would stay away from prediction, but is it forecast or is it kind of targets, you know, aspirations that you want to actually actively make happen? I mean, those are kind of two different ways of going at something. I have a I have an answer, but I'm interested in your opinion because mine's. Do you, do you do you have a sense on what you're thinking? 
Well, it changes the nature of the of the yeah, it does the group and the and the target. But if I had to step back to conversations like this I've had ten years ago and even twenty years ago, where it was mostly about forecasts, um, it was it was fun. It was easy to be kind of over the horizon and, and talk about what you thought was going to come. But I think as a group, we pretty much dodge responsibility, responsibility for a lot of things happening that did not work out the way we thought they would. And there's a, there's reason to think that there's an activist, there's an active thought process that goes into this, you know, and that is, um, you know, kind of going back to the, Al the old Alan Kay um, statement, if you want to, you know, predict the future, you know, build it yourself, make it happen. Yeah. You know, that, that's a, there's, there's something to be said for saying, if there is a, if there is a, an aspiration, if there is a target that you want, that, that as a group, you you think is the right thing to aspire to it changes the nature it says rather than forecasting it how do you how does you how do you make it come to pass or what can you do to influence it in a specific direction uh in terms of topics do we know what topics they're going to be maybe we just that's come up the right, right question. now that's the right question to ask right now lawrence i mean i'm so i'm right, right now i think i have an idea of basically cloud economics, data economics, um, edge, um, open yeah. source, and that's four right there. So what? There's two more. <laughs> um, it might I would be more I would, specific, but yeah. Well, externalities is one of the ones that we really uh, do like to talk about. Okay. Uh, although that might be incorporated in other things. Uh, access to technology is one that we we actually have. So um, uh, technology inequity. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is a big topic. You, and I would I would actually put hardware since we. I was really, going to say I I was waiting for you to 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 lob that one in, Rob. Yeah, I, I actually would turn open source into actually just software, um, and actually maybe even versus SaaS. So I, I think there's SaaS uh, as a business as a model, which is back back to IP and property, which is where the open source conversation sort of goes, but. I, I, I wanted to answer Rich, Rich's question before um, we, we dove too much further in topics. I'm glad to get him on there as a starting point. But Rich, I, I, I think the future prediction ends up putting people's brains in a weird place. Um, prediction or, or active, active pursuit? Prediction. prediction. Um, what, what, I, what I keep coming back to is trend lining. Well, that's what I, that's why I'm saying forecast. I would avoid prediction at all costs. Forecast, there's a difference between, you know, a weather prediction and a weather forecast. You know, a forecast says, eh, we've got an 80% chance. A prediction says it's going to rain tomorrow, right? I, and, and I think you and I are very aligned on this. To me, the, the benefit of forecasting is you, you establish the data points you've got. Mm -hmm. And then you you ex, you extrapolate them forward. Yeah, th this is why the fulcrum thing to me made a lot of sense. It's like, all right, we're forecasting the future here. I need to know where we are. Mm -hmm. I need to know that the the direction you see things moving. And then, and then what what accelerates or or dissipates that momentum? Is the way is the way I think of what we're trying to do. It's like, I don't be, forecast, let me be concrete about that. The forecast is the conventional wisdom. Would you agree about, about that? Um, no, I, I, I think there is. It, not always. I mean, one can sit there and say, you know, there might be conventional wisdom about what you include in a forecast or what you think are the 
the the big influences but you know coming in and say you know i think there's this other major change that we're about to encounter or some new force that you know starting to show up so yeah you could I, come I, out with a different forecast based on not just the past but you know kind of a everything from you know black swan events to you know what yeah. covid has done to us i mean i i i, I understand and i yeah. but in general what i when i see forecasts people just take the chart and they just <laughs> draw out the line farther yeah. and yeah. then you add another variable and the slope changes a little bit it's mm -hmm. it's hard yeah. okay the, yeah but so what would be more value effects are important <laughs> I'm sorry, say again. Butterfly effects are important to make things more. Yeah. If you're going to talk about going down the road, I think you've got a couple of horizons and you've got some unknowns, right? <clears throat> there's what we think about in five years, which we have a much higher degree of certainty to, and then there's what we would think about in 10 years, right? So what's the impact of quantum computing in 10 years? Who knows? Mm -hmm. Right. It's a whole other paradigm to it. Is it going to be an impact in five years? So I, I just tend to think of these things as what are the things that are probably game changers over the next 10 years and what kind of impacts might they have? And then I'd suggest tackling in on a couple of horizons of five year and a 10 year. But to me, the, the five year horizon is almost what the trend line is. The ten-year horizon is the what disrupts that trend line. Is that John? Is that? Yeah. So like, and, and, and yeah. You know, so AI chips. We don't really know where they're going to take us to. We're quantum computing. We really don't know where that's going to take us to. There's a number of things that are much more typical to predict, and there's things that are much more predictable. That's why I just kind of put it in a couple of timelines like that. And mm -hmm. and you know, what are the things we think of that might be really impactful in ten years that are really tough to predict today? Right, so, so imagine a 100,000 fold increase in compute capacity. What, what are you gonna do with that? Yep. Oh shoot, I'm, I'm working into, uh, in the agenda, by the way, whoever is typing down at the, the bottom, let me pull this down. So, so one of the areas I think that is not being looked at particularly closely and it's kind of sort of open source, but it's the uh, decentralized web movement. We've got mm. some oh, fairly privacy. heavyweight luminaries working in the area and some uh, interesting organizations. Right now it's, it's very uh, home computer club level, but it, has a fair amount of uh, intellectual force behind it. So that's one of the areas where folks like Forrester and, and other folks, the more corporate folks are going to ignore, but could make a big difference because it's much more peer to peer. And uh, it can both uh, interact, use the, the commercial cloud, but it can spin off more along the lines of edge clouds all over the place and have a different, it has a different push and focus than the more corporate aspects that we're used to. Yeah, there are actually those topics that actually don't have a trend line yet because there's not a, they're, exactly they're not necessarily there isn't a lot of history behind them there isn't a a vector that you can say they're on uh but the speed with which some of these things do happen there's every reason to think that if the right you know if the stars and planets align you know a distributed web or um you know uh basically autonomous or kind of self-organizing um, mesh networks at the edge. I mean, a lot of these but, types of things could make a difference, but. But I, I think we've actually been pretty good in like some of the edge conversations 
of, a de of identifying prereqs for some of those things to take off. But right? it's I, a different model that these folks are working with, essentially consider them crypto kitties with mm -hmm. a purpose of turning every phone into part of the cloud, <laughs> uh, but also taking the power away from the large corporations. So there, there is a mindset amongst these folks mm -hmm. that has, uh, that can shift what might be going on in the cloud in 2030. So I, 10 years is a lot of years for for 20 year old nobody's <laughs> using these decentralized apps i just literally a couple weeks ago i looked nobody is using these decentralized apps there's almost no developers besides developers who are building decentralized finance apps to trade cryptocurrency it's it's not just the crypto the crypto uh, is enabling the the trust the trust zero trust but the that, folks that are building, uh, there, there's a meeting going on Thursday if you want to, uh, some lightning talk. But uh, you look at who's backing it, and they're providing some interesting direction. I, uh, so I understand. I think that Rob was right to put, put distributed infrastructure under the edge category. So, I mean, it's a legitimate topic, and I, and I follow this topic, Rocky, so I'm not trying to dismiss it out of hand. I'm just trying to say, I don't think it should be one of the six topics we discuss. That's all I was trying, that's what oh, I'm Oh, oh yeah, I, I, I agree. It's just that it's, I, yes, uh, it's, it's not a topic. It is uh, a trend vendor. So another way of thinking about that is you know, when Van Jacobson was working on name data networking, it was all based on where he thought the internet wouldn't scale. Right. So when you think about trends, where do we think the tipping points are where our current methodologies won't be sufficient? And he was wrong, right? It, it was right. I'm just suggesting there's a, a his, his entire thesis was is that we messed up, we built it incorrectly, this won't scale. We have to fundamentally change the paradigms of how we actually build networks. Right. It, it really didn't stand up, but it's on the same vein of what Rocky's talking about. The premise, though, is, you know, which portions of our current infrastructure over the next 10 years are, are going to become the tilting point that forces changes in our technology approach. So I actually just talked to Vint the other day and his big regret was not having enough, not thinking of IPv6. Hmm. Yeah. Not security, not identity, IPv6. <laughs> <Cool>. <laughs> that actually would come into solving some of those other problems. Yeah. It, it didn't put security in that same box. It came, it came up. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, that, that rabbit hole is so tempting. I'm going to. Yeah, but, but, the, but the comment on scale. <laughs> yeah. But the comment on scale on scalability um with a you know and you know and sort of that edge that edge play was definitely definitely top of mind like it wasn't even a wasn't even a heartbeat in his response i i mean this is where there's so much interesting stuff even in the current news like amazon's outage because you know they have multi-thousands of machines running a core infrastructure service that they broke uh, there's look, that's it's centralization. Th there is, but that's actually look. That's a because uh, of like Tuesday's call. It's, it's a great conversation around. There was a design paradigm that was put in play. It, it had knowing scaling limits into it, and so today we're talking about managing a few billion devices. In ten years, we're talking about trillions of devices, right? That's where it's kind of just intonating like where are the breaking points we're going to face, right? There, there are givens that we know where we're going to be at in ten years. And how is that going to force us to design systems and networks and services differently? I, what, all yeah, of those a, all of those AOL disks are coming home to roost. <laughs> 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 uh, now I'm hearing modem sounds. Um, Damn, who I, would I have known, think, right? I, I actually think we have. <laughs> that just topic. got me excited. Sorry, man. <laughs> I guess. Uh, <laughs> I, I I actually think we have a 
a preliminary topic based on what John is suggesting of like having a breaking points, like a spending an hour talking about these breaking points. I would love to sit down and brainstorm as a group, like, all right, let's, let's think about where things are going to break. I mean, I, it strikes me as a topic and yet it also strikes me as this cross-cutting concern for the topics. Yeah. And actually, like to... can I, can I suggest ahead, that John may have said something slightly different? He, okay. can, he can get on me for it one way or another. A tipping point doesn't necessarily mean a break point, breaking point. There mm. are tipping points that happen because something has broken and yeah, got to fix it or you can see it about to, you know, about to go and you better clear out. There are other things that have been put in place that don't reach their activation energy until you've built up enough and you've kind of poured enough into them that suddenly, yeah, we've hit critical mass. And after that, the whole thing flows of its own. So tipping points, change points, some of them are failures and some of them are when we've actually kind of reached an appropriate spot in some effort that we put into place long before and have had to continuously kind of feed and throw resources into until that point where suddenly it's got its own momentum. It's no longer requiring a lot of fuel. Right. So there's inflection points, I think is what you're trying to say. And I'll, I'll uh, use I'll use local storage as an edge compute. Yeah. There's no economic driver today that would allow us to put local storage in edge compute, even though there's good use cases for it. And yeah. some point in life, we're going to get a tipping point. All of a sudden, that makes sense. And I'll throw in 10 years from now, there are no spinning disks. I completely buy into that. So, so uh, I, I would say tipping point is the right topic, and there are different kinds. And I'd like I'd like to make sure that we keep that in mind. They're not all they are not all catastrophic. These tipping points don't always happen because of some catastrophe. They actually can happen because of a trend or because of a of kind of a purposeful effort on the part of the industry. And so we so. Playing off, playing off of that, I was only I was you know half joking about the the AOL disks, but when we're talking about cloud twenty thirty, we've been in and what Rob was just saying, of, you know, sort of about the the breaking points. We've been here before, right? Exactly. Yeah. This isn't new, right? Right. This is not. This is not new. And we and what Rich was just saying is, you know, we hit inflection points that took us from that AOL CompuServe world into another, you know, where, where we're at today. So now we're back in that quasi AOL CompuServe world, right? These wall, the walled gardens, except now they're much bigger gardens. What are those next inflection points that we're going to hit that are going to take us to 20 to 2030? Yeah, they're, they're the walled plantations instead of the walled <laughs> gardens. Okay. Yeah. And, yeah. It, and it's got a few dimensions to it, right? So I, one of the old tandem guys referred to it as, the binary search for the truth, centralized or distributed, <laughs> right? <laughs> Wall gardens are open, right? And there's social inflection points to think about in this as well, right? So one of the problems with device computing is no one's going to basically give their device up for free until Napster came along and they wanted music, <laughs> right? right? So there's different yeah. social drivers in this stuff that will drive consumer behavior that today isn't acceptable. I don't know what that next thing is going to be, but there will be a next thing. Hey, real quick, did, so so I haven't been a part of this this Thursday call until today, unfortunately. But as we're talking through this, um, John, I think based on some of the conversations we've had in the past, you know, that we've all been a part of, and and really, what my question is: Do we have access to resources as we start, kind of like Rob, you're you're going through and kind of lining up like some theories, right? Do we have access to resources where we can start? tapping in and actually exercising some of these theories to actually put some data to it? Or have you guys already done this and I'm just late to the game on this? I see some laughs. I see some like, 
<laughs> and like, hey, dude, you're late to the game. <laughs> well, you're not, what, you're not late. You These mean? are circular conversations. Yeah. 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 What do you mean? I so I don't have access to um, use consulting company data. If that's what you mean. No, um, actually, just keep going. Keep going. Um, but I'm assuming that a few people in, in here, or we could find people to give us access to data that, but we wouldn't be able to share it publicly. Exactly. In other words, someone from Pivotal could get us access to reports, but they wouldn't. We couldn't share it more broadly. Right. Um, I basically, I have act, I ha basically have see almost all cloud related reports that are publicly available for the last seven years. I basically that's what I do. Okay. Um, Why are your eyes bleeding? <laughs> what? Why aren't your eyes bleeding? Yeah, really. Oh, <laughs> uh, oh no. Uh, so I'm. So in terms of, I, if you're looking for some data, I'll find it. But a lot of times the data is not going to be able to prove what you want. Exactly. But if you want something to support, that's basically what I do. That's what I do. Right. So I'm here to help in, in some regard. Yeah, I think I was going down. I mean, that's definitely beneficial. Where I was thinking of it is from, from the perspective of you start looking at actual resources, right? If you you know, like Rob, you know, we could take things like and actually provision things like a distributed way mm -hmm. where we can actually do real life, like put these things together and then use real data. I say real data, it could be, it, could be, it doesn't have to be real customer data where we can start actually seeing these well, points of, go ahead, John. So there's, there's a couple of thoughts. So, you, so I can, I can make a, um, so there's two points to it. I think there's the research reports and then there's the reality. Right, exactly. Right. And having That's spent, my point, yes. And having spent five years in edge compute, working yeah. through all the business cases and everything else, you, you know, I don't think there's an edge compute marketplace for five years. Right. Right, at, at the very best, right? Um, so there, can we get pragmatic people that have been in certain spaces to talk about their experiences, right? Where do we think the market tilting points are and those other stuff? And then are there people we can talk to um, that are basically doing early adopter types of, of yeah. deployments and that kind of stuff. Um, um, so I think of like EdgeX, um, the, the Deutsch um, initiative um, that uh, uh, Jason Hoffman's running, and Jason might be a good insight um, mm -hmm. on those types of things. Somebody, Erickson, um, R&D have been doing some pretty advanced thinking about how to do that stuff. I could call you know, like Eric, um, the CTO over there, and see if they'd be yeah. willing to share some experiences. Is that what you're going towards? Yeah, and actually, and, and there's a couple reasons I'm asking this, and Rob probably knows exactly where I'm going with this, is you know, just recently, um, as of late, um, I'm now the CTO of my, our company, and one of our big drivers is innovation and R&D. And this plays exactly into where we're, we're going with this company, right? And we're already working with some companies in the industry um, on some of these reports and things like this. And, and where I'm going with this is really is this really fits that model, right? Is to start putting these thoughts together and put some constructs around it. And, and you know, like, you know, I, what, what's his name? Uh, Lawrence, like you said, you've got access to that data. We've got access to reports. And that's good, but when you really start talking about this stuff, they're only good for a certain portion, right? Because we really need to prove out to validate those things. And that's where I was going. I don't want to go too far down that. And like I say, I haven't been a part of this conversation per se, but um, you know, I just really filling out, you know, we're we're this could really go somewhere in, in my opinion and some ideas and thoughts that I've had for quite some time. So I'll end it with that. Uh, maybe that maybe this is helpful because I mean when Tim Crawford and I like were were yeah. in the early days of getting this stuff running, he was like, you know, Rob, why do you care? Right. <laughs> okay. That's true. Um, and and Rich and I had a similar conversation. Rich, you actually came back to the one of the things that's very operative to me, which is the future is going to be written by the people who care enough to change it. Absolutely. Right. And, and what I said to Tim was, I said, look, everything tells me right now that Amazon is going to be the only technology company in 2030. As scary as that is, it's very true. Right. They, they, that actually, is, that, that that's, appears that's to be their ambition. It, it may be, but I, I think it's worse than that, right? 
I, I think I'll tell you the, the argument I made at Ericsson, unless we did something and, and tried to create some standards around this, we're going to wind up with complete market fragmentation, right? I mean, it mm -hmm. is Alibaba is not going away, mm -hmm. right? Microsoft's not going away, right? So really, I think you've created almost the worst economic environment we can have where you've got a fragmented market systems, each with proprietary stats. There's no longer one IBM, there's going to be 10. <sighs> And it's not even the proprietary. It's not even the, the technology side. It's also you. You need to add in geopolitics into that as well when it comes to data. And we and we just we just we just put Lawrence on tilt. Yeah, Lawrence is about to go. He is about to go. Oh shit! Eighty trillion economy. percent of the eighty trillion economy is eight trillion dollars. Out of that, four percent of that, okay, is. $300 billion, okay? That is all of Amazon's revenue. $30 billion is AWS revenue. So AWS revenue is about four tenths of a percent of the, U of the world economy. Let's get real. It's not the IT market. Basically, I was trying to basically poke holes in what Jassy was saying the other day. It's right. they don't even control. They control. They don't even control ten percent of the cloud computing economy in terms of economic spend. In terms of broad view of cloud compute spend. So let's stop ah, thinking out the surreal to be horrible. Yeah. They well, control a lot in terms of a certain disposable new spend. But they're not they're not positioned to be dominant in terms of the next AT and T. Yeah. Well, I, or, I, I, I don't, I don't, but I don't think that's the play I, because I actually see right. I mean, look, look, they wanted to automate their factories. They bought a robotics company, yeah. right? It, it when they want to automate deliveries, they're just going to buy Tesla. I mean, this is well, the, the challenge. The challenge is both they have this that, that we're seeing this huge consolidation of capital, and and technology, and, and from an efficiencies play, we 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 are seeing it as justified, and they they are actually a vertically integrated business outside of cloud, where where they are continuing to to extend into other market segments. It's not just cloud. It's I it's. I understand this. They're doing what Walmart did. One, number two is we have this as a segment to talk about in that session. Number uh -huh. three is there's new antitrust laws and regulations movements happening in terms of they're changing the way that they're enforcing laws to be proactive in terms of prohibiting mergers and acquisitions that aren't necessarily um, going to be creating monopolies itself. So in the past, they wouldn't let large companies buy small companies. They would let large companies buy small companies, even if it wouldn't create a monopoly. Like in this instance of Visa buy, buying Plaid. Now they're pushing against that, even though it's not going to create a, mon a monopoly market for other reasons. So it's just there's, there's it's, yeah. hope. Well, but but let me let me give you because you all had such a, a <laughs> powerful reaction to the first half of my <laughs> statement. Which I love. Um, it means I'm getting my statements right. Uh, the second half of it was just right. Do I, you know, how do I either disrupt that concern if it's true, right? Is it true or not? And then where where's the fulcrums to disrupt it? This is why I started with with fulcrums because I want to know. Well, you know geopolitical is is one of the fulcrums. I mean, when yeah. I was at Huawei, what it was three years ago, where they just threw thirteen billion at AI, which was like 10 times more Million. than what oh, the US government threw at it for basic R&D. So China, Al Alibaba and uh, the Chinese government, et cetera, Indian government's not getting into it as much and India's not getting into it as much, but you know, let's, let's not be uh, parochial here. The world has bigger things than Amazon out there, like Lauren said, or yeah. things that can get bigger faster because of 
uh, resources. Well, and that could be the inflection point, right? It could be. I, I, hey, can I suggest a, a topic title for this one? Please. Did, did you ever watch Demolition Man? Yes. Oh my God, not for ages. <laughs> all restaurants, all restaurants are Taco Bell. They run the franchise war. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Sorry, that's just what came to my mind. But I, I, I look at it. That's, that's a snow crash. That's a snow crash statement to me. Is even more the, uh, the, the, yeah. the other way to think about this is since we we threw the term GDP in there, right? Um, and you think about the state of impact on industries today, right? Yeah, you know, the number I throw around when you look at the digital transformation, we've got like eighty four percent failure rates. Right. So over the next four years, if you look at the spend, that's going to result in about six trillion dollars in wasted spend, which is larger than the GDP of Japan. And that's great for consultants. <laughs> well, oh, come great. on, that was worth I laugh. To that. I laughed. I, I I think it's an in indication of how immature the technology is. Right. Part of maybe part of the thing that we're not talking about here. Is just how early we actually are. It's, it's the culture. The digital transformation doesn't fail because of technology. It it fails because um, because of the culture and the mindset and the leadership. It, it's a combination of both. It's a combination of the technology has become very complex. The leaning curve, learning curve is very steep, and then you throw yeah. into it the fact it requires a cultural shift to be competing with the Amazon. That is incredibly difficult to make. And so those are some pretty big topics that are gonna impact us over the next five to 10 years. Yeah, I think that's huge. I agree with you, John. Uh, it, uh, great analog would be the US auto industry being disrupted by um, uh, Japanese in the 1980s. I mean, they were touring the plants in Japan. They had access to the process and the knowledge and were still unable to uh, uh, to transform, which is exactly and it's not because of the technology, right? It's the yeah. mindset. exactly. But what what the technologists got out of it, uh, in some ways, unfortunately, was the the technology, the process, and so that's why everyone started modeling stuff with the name of just in time and and lean and things like that. I, I think it's really cultural. Dell, that Dell was the one that showed the way, and the automotive manufacturers actually learned from the transformations that were happening in manufacturing outside of their industry, but yet in the United States. Cool. True. You know, I think the culture ones, it, it, it's interesting because, like, one of the analysts I was talking to was like, everyone's now going to low code, no code to solve some of these technology adoption curves, right? But it really doesn't solve it. I, I kind of use, you know, the Salesforce example in the last uh, one we did is, you know, that, that without kind of best practices being shareable um, and, and what's the word, matured over time, what you really get is people using a low code tool to basically build the wrong thing and then someone else coming in and building the wrong thing again. Right. So uh, all I'm saying is technology can't cure the lack of knowledge and the culture issues. So I, 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 str I strongly agree with that. I, but I also feel like everything that we build is so fragile. Like we're still like we're arguing about Kubernetes, like it's the answer to a thing. It's a it's an intermediate point in the journey. Well, it's um, a very incomplete component. I mean, yeah, another way of speaking about this is what are the pieces we think we need to have to create robust platforms, right? But I think that's probably a little bit too low level for what you want to do here. I, it, it, well, it is, but if you back, if you take two steps back from that, then you you start talking about, you know, um, like we did on Tuesday, standards versus open, right? And and what's, what's you know, we, we are right now driving this industry in a way that we think open source is the same as standardization. <laughs> and it's and it's not, um, and and we're actually making these markets. I mean, to your point about, um, you know, this incredibly fragmented market with the different you know hyperscale cloud providers that, and having no standards behind them. You're right. That is the absolute antithesis of a successful market. And Might that actually, I heard that from a a guy who spent seven or nine years in Google. 
that's why in many ways Google is not Amazon. It's not in many ways as successful because inside Google, everybody's just going to the repositories and grabbing cool stuff that somebody else wrote and tossing it into their, their code base. And Google has no standards inside of it. Yeah. And, uh, and we're seeing the results of it. I once heard someone describe Microsoft as a giant beehive <laughs> where- <laughs> That's a 10 minute warning. <laughs> where a uh, giant beehive where the bees are crashing into each other and not getting anything done because from the outside, it looks like a very active, productive beehive. From the inside, it looks like a traffic mess. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I think, you know, the, the, when you think of Google, right, or, or more appropriately Alphabet, right, as they try and penetrate the multiple industries, right, there's one thrust of Google where, and Amazon, where they, they are looking to move out from their bases into other uh, industries where today they've got consumers, but they're going to cannibalize those and grow into those marketplaces. The other one with Google, I always think of is nothing's ever production it's always beta there is a mentality internally right that that makes it tough for them to shift into shift into enterprises which i think is really more the focus of what you're talking about their, their corporate yeah. culture is based around innovation and and the fact nothing's ever done which is a true statement they just happen to ship it out as production code and nothing's ever safe either everything's always on the chopping block <sighs> yes yes so I want to my USB adapters. tie this back to Tuesdays. Uh, John was talking about, you know, technical is a little bit too low level, whatnot. Tuesdays seem to be more of the technical, lower level discussions. And Thursdays seem to be up a notch along those lines. Also, Tuesday, we, we've been talking a lot of infrastructure as code. And I think that this is kind of sort of one of those inflection points on size, similar to the transition from LSI to VLSI. We need that new language, that new way of dealing with it that codifies and modularizes infrastructure such that it can be handled with the next level of abstraction. Don't, don't just put it as infrastructure, right? I, I, I... Yep. The conclusion yeah. I've over the last two years of kind of stepping back and looking at things is our entire development methodologies haven't really changed much since 1970, <laughs> right? Um, they are they are woefully inaccurate and they have not been inadequate and they have not kept pace with needs. And I, I firmly believe there's going to be an evolution in how we develop software, right? And, and trying to think about what that evolution would look like is an interesting topic. And then I, I kind of threw out there, you know, one of the things I think it's going to become more prevalent that deals with your repository stuff, which is the ability to basically, you know, move into a social development environment where the repository is data driven and it's curated and it can actually help people leverage code in an appropriate fashion. You're talking um, about code repositories, not data repositories, right? I'm talking about code repositories. Although and data, is a for data, also. Although data is another interesting thing, but I'm just, my, my thought, if you're talking 10 years out, I, I will tell you, I don't think the way we write software today will even be in existence 10 years now. That's an interesting I think you're right. statement. I'm terrified about that, but I think you're right. <laughs> I think it's going to be like mainframes, like the, uh, the cool kids are not going to be doing it the old way, but there will be plenty of Luddites out there that are still writing C++ programs. I, yeah, this is, this to me is where AIML can, can really transform what, what we're talking about in this here. Well, I think there's a few things that need to happen here and it does tie into the data theme, right? Is today we have no metrics we apply to software. Right. I mean, I, I'll very, very few. So one of the constant arguments inside of my prior enterprises and other ones is this team is better than that team. Their code is better than that team. Right. Applying metrics to the development process and then to the actual software delivery piece is really, really, really early days. Right. And, and I think over the next 10 years, we're going to get better at measuring 
and creating productivity out of that. And AI and ML can certainly help um, in that task. But we really don't even talk about today what are the right KPIs to use, right? In, in terms of measuring these things. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then when we talk about, you know, reused code, if we don't measure the effectiveness of that code, right? I, I would, you know, you want to go to the, the whole black swan theory, right? I mean, Amazon's outage was completely predictable, right? There was really nothing new that happened here, yeah. right? What, what we lacked is the intelligence and the operations systems to see we're getting close to an edge so we could make a shift in time. They're uh, very ironic then that they introduced an AI operations assistant uh, within a week of uh, Ooh, that a conspiracy theory. I like it. No, I, I, I think that does. <laughs> yeah, um, and their, their next outage will be something that they didn't put into the but AI. <laughs> I, you know, it's I, kudos to them for operating at this scale. It's very, but, but I, John, I agree with you. It's and I, I felt a little bit bad. I didn't mean to beat up on AWS that that much <laughs> on Tuesday. Um, it was a very predictable thing and that kind of stuff. But it, it's also a learning curve as an industry where, you know, we go with what's good enough until it breaks and then we innovate, right? The, the, which is a secondary problem with this is, yeah. you know, part of the value of having built large scale distributed systems in the past, you kind of know where those inflection points are, where those breaking points are. Yep. And, and if you don't have that expertise, which let's face it, there's not much of it on the planet today, right. that and people are going to continually run into those walls. And so, you know, that's the other side of the challenge is, you know, knowing when you're going to be up against the wall and allowing yourself enough runway to correct it before you get there. Yep. I, I, I have a much more sinister comment related to what you just said, which is, Amazon's architecture is driven by maximizing its monetary benefit for its services. And so one of the concerns that I have in what you're describing, while I think it's easy to, it's, it's not easy. It's, it's reasonable to say, Hey, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're accelerating, they're getting bigger. All this stuff is great. Um, the, the idea of having thousands of kinesis machines running a backend system and doing all that stuff. Um, there's scale benefits to doing it, but it, there's also commercial benefits for Amazon in the way they've structured their services. Yeah, um, I, I, I can't, it'd be interesting to have an, I don't, from talking to people at Amazon, I mean, one, I think fortuitously, I don't know whether that's by plan or by luck, <laughs> right? Whether they're trying to design autonomous systems, ah. right? And and it happens to work out very well financially, but there's a counterbalance to that, right? So I mentioned then you'll get an R store or you'll get a Wasabi that, that combines those services, knocks 80% off, which will force Amazon to respond from an economic fashion, right? Mm -hmm. um, the other, what I would, the thing about the, the, the other thing that I took out of that is that they, they made some fundamental faux pas in the, the deployment of their architecture, right? You don't mix production with customer, right? You click isolation barriers. So even if you want to use the same Kinesis servers, you, you should never use those servers for your own internal production. You want that isolation so that a production outage doesn't cause a command and control outage, yeah, right? That was, so that, that was clearly one of the biggest failings of the of, that came out of the, yeah. Hey guys, we're at the end of time. I, I have one comment I wanted to make about the um, the the plan. Uh, Please like the <laughs> take the, us back. Yeah, take, take us back to the plan. Uh, I, I would propose what we do is define two or at most three inflection points, and then make the topics the six topics the the pillars or the drivers of those inflection points. And that so, things like edge and cloud economics and all of those things are actually horizontal in all of those uh, sections. Um, I love, because, I love that idea. No, it's a great. And so so we, we have. And, and so yeah. here's here's what I'm going to suggest. Um, next week we're doing hardware. The week after that, let's let's do on inflection points, um, and that'll let us fill out this grid. I'll like lock down uh, the topics to something that we can propose. I, and we'll try and do a, a grid. I don't, I think that the inflection points should be the, an outcome of the, of the breakout sessions. 
let's let's see where we get in the okay. in the discussion of them because the way the way we've been doing this is that we have conversations here sometimes oh. they result in big topics we need more discussion on sometimes they're cross-cutting concerns mm -hmm. and so let's 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 focus on what the inflection points could be and then Lawrence, to your point we will figure out at at the end of that if we should structure it uh tyler i i I think you're I agree with your intuition, but I think Lawrence is right to say let's let's put it all together, see if it looks right and then make a decision. Um, yeah, I'm just, just I'm, I'm proposing a structure for how we get to something that is that has good alignment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, by the way, since someone put my two can, you did that, Rob, remember 2036 is coming up. Why <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> just around the corner again? <laughs> Yeah. Oh God, that's yeah. right. All right. With, with the end of an epoch is a good way to close out the end of this meeting. And I will see you all next week. Have a good day. <laughs> These are amazing guys. discussions. Thank you all. Yeah. All right. See you guys. <laughs>